Hey guys, assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In this video, we're going to do a little bit of review on what we've learned throughout the semester. In this review, I won't be teaching anything, okay, because it will take too much time. Instead, I will go through the topics one by one, and I will highlight what are the important bits in each topic. So if you need any clarification on any particular concept or topic, you need to go back to the respective video lecture. Let's begin with topic one, introduction to statistics. Now we began our course with the definition of statistics. We also learned why it is important for us to learn this particular subject. Okay, and then we learned about the different types of statistics. Here we can see statistics is divided into two types. One, it's called the descriptive statistics. Descriptive or the root word describe, what it means is we describe our data or we summarize it and present it in such a way that makes sense to our audience. All right. Um, now, the way to describe data is further learned in topic two. Okay. Now, the next type of statistics is called the inferential statistics or the root word inference. So, you know what making inference is? Okay, here is basically where we learn how to select samples from a given population. And from our sample, we conduct a study on it, right? So whatever result we get from our sample, we further generalize it back to the population. So that's basically what it means by making an inference from our sample data. All right, so that's basically the two types of statistics. And then we also learned about variables and data. Okay, so now there's a slight difference between the two. Variable here is basically a characteristic that we are interested in in a particular study. Okay, so the root word of variable is varies. What that means is the values of the variables are not fixed. It's always changing. So if you're asked to define a variable, you cannot give a number. Okay, so it has to be a statement. Right? Whereas data here is basically the facts and figures that we collect uh, that reflects a particular variable. For instance, if I'm interested in the variable height, I will go to your class and collect all of the heights of the students. Okay, so that is data, whereas the height is the variable. And then we also learned about the different types of data. Now there are two types of data. The first one is a qualitative data from the root word quality. Okay, so what that means is this data cannot be measured numerically. So how do we measure the data? So we measure uh, using names or labels or even categories. That is why qualitative data is also known as categorical data. Okay, let's write it down, categorical. All right, now the second type of data is quantitative data. The root word quantity. So what that means is the data can be measured numerically. All right, so the, uh, the quantitative data is further divided into discrete and continuous data. Discrete here simply means that the data can take certain values, okay? And there are usually gaps between the values, certain values. For instance, the number of cars or number of children. We have one car, two cars, three children, okay? We don't have two and a half cars or 10.75 children, okay? Get what I mean? All right, so that's discrete. Uh, quantitative data. The second type of quantitative data is continuous. Now from the word continuous, what it means is the data can take any value. Okay, just now with certain values, now the data can be any value, but within a specified range. For instance, time taken to do an exam. Say your exam is for three hours. A person can finish the exam in one hour, in two hours, in two and a half hours, but they cannot go or exceed three hours. So basically, there's a specified range, but within the range, it can take any value. And the last thing that we learned under topic one is levels of measurement. Levels of measurement is also called scales of measurement, okay? As you can see here, there are four levels of measurement. The first is called the nominal level, okay? So what it means here is the data is basically measured um, not by numbers, but by names or labels. Right? Uh, that is why nominal level of measurement is also known as the lowest level because there's no actual measurement involved. All right? Now, when we talk about ordinal level, it's basically nominal, but there's a slight advantage whereby the data can also be ranked or ordered. So in that way, the ordinal level of measurement is slightly stronger than nominal. 
Okay, then we move on to the third level, which is the interval level of measurement. Here, interval is basically ordinal, which means you can rank the data. But this time, not only you can rank it, but we can also calculate the differences between um, the data. Okay, like before, if it was ordinal, we just know something is higher than or lower than something. That's it. But we don't know the magnitude or how much is it higher, how much is it lower. But with interval, yes, we can know how much is the uh, difference. All right. Now, finally, the strongest or the highest level of measurement is the ratio level. Ratio is basically interval, meaning that we can rank and we can calculate the difference between the values. But this time around, for ratio, there is a meaningful zero. In other words, there's a zero starting point. What that means is if the value of a particular variable is zero, such as zero income, what it means is literally that person has no income. All right. Okay, so to summarize, the first two levels of measurement, nominal and ordinal, they are both usually involving qualitative data or qualitative uh, variables, whereas the interval and ratio levels of measurement usually involves quantitative data and variables. Okay, because we can measure them. So as you can see, uh, anything that's has numbers attached to it, it becomes slightly stronger, right? We can find percentages, we can find proportions, we can divide, we can multiply, we add and stuff. Whereas if it's just qualitative data set, uh, there's not much we can do with it, okay? So um, let's summarize again. So as you can see, there are several things that we've learned in topic one. The first was the definition of statistics and why we learn it, the different types of statistics, the difference between variables and data, the different types of data, and finally, the levels of measurement. Now let's move on to topic two, uh, which is describing data. Now I mentioned to you just now from topic one here, okay, one of the different types of statistics is descriptive statistics, right? There are generally three ways to describe our data or to make it make sense to our readers and our audience. One is by using tables. Because sometimes when we have data, they're just scattered everywhere. Okay, there's just too many of them, so we need to organize them in such a way that makes sense to us, right? Besides tables, we can also use graphs or diagrams or charts, okay? Now, I may have mentioned in class, these two methods, uh, we don't teach you in our syllabus. Okay, uh, what we focus in our class is the third method, which is using numerical measures. So how can we describe our data using the numerical measures? There are basically two ways, okay? So if you want to describe or explain our data using numerical measures, there are basically two ways. One is its central tendency. Where's the center of our data set, okay? So central tendency can be measured by three ways, mean, median, and mode. Okay, so you may have remembered we learned three different types of means, the arithmetic mean, the weighted mean, and the geometric mean. Please note each of them by heart and how are they different from each other and which one is um, more used in different circumstances. Okay, so you need to know that. All right, mean is basically the average value of our data set. Now we also have median. Median here means the middle value. Whereas mode here is the value that occurs most frequently. Most frequently. All right? So basically these are the three different measures of central tendency. All three tells us what is the center of our data set. That's why it's called central tendency. Where's the center? Where's the middle point of our data set? Now, the second thing that we can use to describe our data is called the dispersion, okay? In other words, it's not enough just to know where's the center of our data. We want to know how far or how near all of the data are from the center. So that's basically what dispersion talks about. Now, there are three measures of dispersion, range, uh, standard deviation, and variance. Okay, range is basically where we minus the largest value, with the smallest value in our data set. Whereas, okay, standard deviation and variance are related. This is basically the positive square root of variance, okay? Uh, so please check back at the formulas how to um, calculate them, all right? Now, let's move on here. Okay, now, speaking of the different measures of center tendency, you can actually see that there's a relationship, okay? There's actually a relationship between these three. 
if your data set is symmetrical, okay, symmetrical, what it means is if you were to fold it in half, the right hand side will be exactly equal to the left hand side, right? So if our data set is symmetrical, all of these three measures would be equals to each other, okay? Whereas if our data is skewed or non-symmetrical, they'll not be the same. Okay, so please go back and review that particular topic. We've got two types of skewness, which is related here. Okay, we have the positively skewed, tail is long to the right, and we have negatively skewed, tail longer to the left. Right, so here if it's positively skewed, we begin by this point, this is our mode. Okay, and here in the middle is always the median, and what's left, mean. Here if it's negatively skewed, here's our mode. Middle here is the median, and what's left is the mean. Okay, so please know which is where. You need to know the location of each one of them. This only happens if our data is skewed. Okay, remember, if our data is symmetrical, okay, what it means is all the three measures of center tendency will be equals to each other, right? As for dispersion, okay, specifically standard deviation, we can also have several applications of the standard deviation, okay? So we've learned two applications of the standard deviation. One is the Chebyshev's theorem, and the other one is the empirical rule. Now, these two applications are basically telling us um, the dispersion or the width or the spread of our data set, okay? So remember the difference between these two? Empirical rule can only be used for a symmetrical distribution. All right, whereas Chebyshev's theorem can be used for any distribution, meaning that it can be used for skewed distribution. Moving on to topic three, index or index numbers. Uh, we began this topic with the definition of index. What's an index? It's basically a number, yeah? A number that shows relative changes in a variable uh, or a group of variables between two time periods. So how do we calculate index? This is the very basic way, okay? We take the current value, we divide by the base value, and then we multiply 100. Then it will give us the index. Here, it's, since it's price, so this is basically our price index. So this is the simple price index, also known as price relative. Now, once we know how to calculate the index, we've also learned how to interpret it. Okay, so how can we interpret the index? There are basically two things we need to talk about, which are the direction, okay, whether it's more than 100 or less than 100. If it's more than 100, it means there's an increase in the price. If it's less than 100, it's, there's a fall in the price. Another thing that we need to talk about is the magnitude. How big is the increase? How small is the increase? So that's basically where we look at the figures. Okay, so basically we learned about the definition and then the basic way and how to calculate the basic type of index and how to interpret. And of course, the most important part is the different types of indexes, yeah? There are generally two types of indexes. One is the unweighted index and the other one is the weighted index. Unweighted index, okay, let's zoom in. Unweighted index, basically we're just focusing on the changes in price. It's not weighted by uh, quantity. Okay, so there are two types of unweighted index, the simple average index and the simple aggregate index. The difference is, of course, in the word average and aggregate. For simple average index, we calculate all of the index first. How? By using this formula. Okay, so we have several index that we calculate separately, and then we find the average of those index. Okay, whereas for simple aggregate index, what we do is we calculate or we sum up the prices. Okay, so that's the main difference. Here we find the average of the index. Here we actually calculate the sum of the current prices divided by the sum of the base prices. Okay, so if you need more info on this, you just um, refer back to your notes. Okay. And the second type of index is the weighted index. Here, we basically calculate index using both price and quantity. In other words, each item is weighted according to its importance. Okay, so the way it's weighted is by using the quantity. Um, so there are, here there are generally two types of weighted index. One is the Las Pires index. Now we have the Pashi index. Now, the main difference between Las Pires and Pashi is that for Las Pires, we focus on the base quantities. For Pashi index, we focus on the current quantities. Okay? And then, of course, um, please know the pros and cons of each. 
And then there's another guy, Fisher. He attempts to find the average of these two. That's where we have the Fisher's ideal index. Okay, so Fisher's ideal index is basically the geometric mean of the last Perez and Pashi index together. And of course, we have the value index. We're focused on calculating the value. What that means is, if the price belongs to the current period, we multiply with the quantity of the current period. If the price belongs to the base period, we multiply with the quantity for the base period. And finally, we've also learned a bit of applications for indexes. Uh, most common application is this consumer price index or CPI uh, where we use uh, the CPI to determine real income, to deflate sales, as well as to calculate the uh, purchasing power of the dollar.